Thanks, folks, for coming along tonight, and thanks to those on the Zoom call in uh, in parts of Sydney and parts of New South Wales, other parts of Australia, and some overseas to hear Senator Karen Little um, talk for us for the first occasion. She's a very welcome guest. She's well known to all of you, I guess, but I'll introduce her briefly. She has a BA and an MBA from the University of Adelaide. Her early career, she was an ABC journalist based in Adelaide and also in, then in Darwin. She worked in corporate affairs, mainly in human resource areas. She ran, has run her own business or businesses. And of course, elected Senator for South Australia at the May 22 election and taking up her position on the 1st of July that year. And a, a very quick promotion followed. So Senator Little is also now uh, the Shadow Minister for Child Protection and the Prevention of Family Violence. Senator Little, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that welcome. And uh, thank everyone for coming um, to have a listen to some of the things I'd like to raise um, in talking about voice and other Indigenous matters. As an Aranda woman of the Central Desert, I acknowledge the Gadigal peoples who are part of Sydney's metropolitan group of 29 clans known as Eora Nation. I was born and raised in Central Australia, in regional Australia, where far too much disadvantage exists and is compounded by the challenges of isolation and distance, especially for those whose home is more remote. It exists too in our major capital cities. The many contributors to disadvantage are complex and very likely different for each and every individual. Disadvantage though is not a constant state. It can change in a heartbeat. It can be lifelong. It can be intergenerational. When those contributing factors, poverty, housing, stress and trauma, economic and social exclusion are mitigated, when we get it right, overcoming much disadvantage is indeed possible. Disadvantage is not permanent, perpetual. Birth does not necessarily condemn you to it. It is neither a cultural or racist racial matter but it can present disproportionately in some groups compared to others. Both my parents are Aranda people, the language and cultural group of the area surrounding Alice Springs. I also have close blood ties to Anangu, Pitjantjara, Yunkajara peoples of the Central Desert. You know the area closer to Uluru. My indigeneity is my identity, and I am also so proud to be just an ordinary Australian. I was raised with culture, country, language and community and will thank forever for the belief in my parents that these things and professional and personal success must coexist. In fact, they are inseparable. In my first speech in the Australian Parliament just over 14 months ago, I raised my concern about the divisiveness, risk and implications of focus on race. In my first speech, I said, I get angry when others seek to define me firstly or only by race, and I know from experience it is getting worse. And yet, here we are, a nation divided over race. This referendum is currently the cause of conflict in our homes, in our workplaces, on our streets, and between friends and colleagues, and even strangers. In Adelaide, just last week, we witnessed truly ugly scenes. It was, sorry, it was this week, actually. Um, protesters were hurling racist abuse, spitting, shouting, foul obscenities, simply because people came to hear three Aboriginal speakers explain why we were voting no <coughs> at this referendum question and why we publicly are happy to share why we say no to voice. And today we see a social media post going viral, which looks to be spitting at a passerby at a Canberra-based Yes campaign stall. Yes, even before a single vote is cast, this referendum divides us. And regardless of the referendum result, the fallout will be enduring. This division is palpable, but in no way should it be a surprise. When you load up with a motion, a proposition, when you make it personal rather than logical and purposeful, good people can do bad things. And those who behave badly 
just get licence to do so worse. The Prime Minister has split our nation. This is on him. The Prime Minister has delivered this no compromise proposition to the people and it is the Prime Minister who has overseen this terribly designed and constructed path to disunity. Our foundation document, the Australian Constitution, finalised in 1901, talks about the work of Parliament, the work of the Executive, the Judiciary, the Governor-General, the States and Territories, Finance and Trade. It belongs to all Australians equally. Yet there was no constitutional convention on voice for all Australians to participate. Australians are being asked a single question containing two separate notions, one being recognition in the constitution, the other being a permanently enshrined body called voice. The voice proposition is risky, the details are unknown, and if successful, it will be permanent. Let me explain. I've been watching this since Uluru 2017. Media reports way back then spoke of dissent. That dissent and unrest has been public from the very beginning. Since entering Parliament 14 months ago, my reservations have only increased in line with the contact I've had from Aboriginal people who don't know what this is, who don't believe this is the answer, and who tell me they will say no to this referendum. The magnificent sports stars, celebrities and ordinary Australians are not wrong for wanting to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians, and they are not wrong for supporting a reconciled Australia. We all want that. This proposition, though, is not about recognition alone. The voice is legally risky, and in the Constitution, words matter. And Australians know to think very carefully about that, and they should. In the Referendum Joint Parliamentary Committee, looking at this, the High Court experts, judges, lawyers and academics could not agree on the extent of risk with the words representation, matters and executive government. The most prominent argument I heard was the removal of executive government because it lacked clarity and yet the government proceeded. No issue is beyond its scope and no issue is off limits. Everything, in fact, is at large. Ian Callanan, former High Court judge, predicts a decade or more of constitutional and administrative law litigation arising out of voice. This, he said, opens a legal can of worms. It is unqualified. There were questions of an implied duty to consult, duty to consider, and no precedent that a future High Court could rely on. The flock of eminent legal and learned High Court experts contributed their views, but true to form and the profession, there was simply no agreement. In the end, as with anything referenced in the Constitution, it's not the Parliament, it's not lawyers, it's not us, it's the High Court that would rule on any challenge, and any Australian can seek leave of appeal to the High Court. Indeed, Professors Marcy Langton and Tom Calmer in their voice report were told by those consulted and I quote, non-justiciability must be an essential feature of voice design, end of quote. And yet Professor Langton said as chair, she was duty bound to sign off, but did not personally agree with that proposition. So what else, what else did they write? What else are they telling us that they do not truly believe in? A constitutional body, a committee for one group, means permanently dividing Australians. Constitutional academic and Australian Human Rights Commissioner Lorraine Finlay argues, in quotes, it inserts race into the Australian Constitution in a way that undermines the foundational human rights principles of equality and non-discrimination, end quotes. How can it therefore be seriously argued this is not a concept of race? As an Indigenous Australian, Voice allows me to vote. It allows me to nominate, to be elected to the voice. And the matters it works on are intended to be relevant to me. It is without doubt a concept of them and us. Permanency in the Constitution perversely suggests a perpetual state of disadvantage. 
Notwithstanding the good work done by some service providers and public service agencies, the dysfunction sits in the service delivery system and supply chain. Its complexity, its disconnect, and its failure to deliver outcomes rather than outputs. You know the saying that is insanity is to keep doing the same thing while expecting a different result? Well, another committee, except that this one is in the Constitution, is quite simply, I believe, just that. I now amplify the voices of those who are being ignored or silenced right now in this discussion. Helen Secretary, an Aboriginal woman that lives in the Northern Territory and is the equivalent of a mayor in a local top end community, she says no, arguing it's a waste of money. And she didn't want people considered differently because of their Indigenous identity. From the Anangu Pitjantjara land, senior Aboriginal lawmen and custodians of that most sacred place to them, Uluru, Mr Murray George, Mr Clem Toby, Mr Owen Burton and Mr Trevor Adamson described how they felt betrayed, disrespected and ignored. Their most sacred place continues to be used for political and promotional purpose of this referendum proposition. Through a professional interpreter, those senior men told me, they don't want to be associated with a push for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament. They don't see their hopes and dreams for them and their grandchildren delivered through the voice. They will vote no. But they also know Australians can do better. These people who say no do exist. These people who say no are real. They are not the product of artificial intelligence, as some have wrongly claimed, and they have found a way to have voice about voice. I'll turn now to constitutional recognition. I've net, not yet come across any Australian that disagrees with wanting to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. Not one single conversation, not anywhere. <coughs> I have also not heard any Australian who does not agree with recognising the 70,000 year old history, based on carbon dating, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, not a single challenge of that notion, not anywhere. The coalition has always supported a form of recognition, but this proposition, I personally believe, is overreach. I appreciate that there are people politically, professionally and personally invested in this outcome, and that may be clouded and galvanised their no compromise position, but this is such an important decision and is not one to be made on emotion, intimidation or for posterity. It has been argued too that race is already within our constitution and that is true. Section 25 is redundant, a relic of the past and relates to who cannot vote. Section 51 gives effect to special legislation for people of any race that deals with things like cultural heritage, land rights, native title and it allowed for the Northern Territory intervention. But six, session 51 remains unchanged with this proposed change. Many of the architects, the collaborators and the promoters of voice know this too well because they were there in the early land rights struggles in the negotiations on native title and yet here many of them are convincing us voice is and must be the only way forward. Now I'm going to turn to some truth telling. We're bombarded with claims and now slick advertising that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples do not already have a voice. That is simply not true. I'm one of 11 politicians in the Australian Parliament today. It's a pretty impressive collection of voices, though we don't always agree. There's an Indigenous ambassador, Indigenous advocates, commissioners, and there's experts on the Coalition of Peaks, comprising of about 80 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations representing some 800 organisations. The Coalition of Peaks already speaks to the parliamentary cabinet, two ministers, and has no restriction on who they speak to or what they speak on. Indigenous Australians have a voice through more than 3,000 bodies that have funded more than 5.3 billion in Commonwealth Indigenous specific expenditure to improve the lives of our most marginalised. 
particularly the no nearly 140,000 Indigenous Australians living in remote or very remote areas. The role of the National Indigenous Australians Agency that reports to the Minister for Indigenous Australians, who's also an Indigenous woman, and whose sole purpose in NIAA is to deliver Indigenous programs and overseeing the 4.3 billion investment through its role of advising government on improving lives through consultation and engagement. In fact, the Albanese government's own budget papers in October 2022 and May 2023 use language of co-design, co-collaboration. These are existing concepts, language and practice within processes of the parliament and in the executive government. Last week, I attended the Australian Press Club to hear my colleague, Senator Nampajimpa Price, speak on the referendum. I was pleased to see adorning their walls pictures of Indigenous speakers presented like an honour roll. Eight esteemed speakers who identify as Indigenous Australians, four of whom are coincidentally also on the government appointed referendum working group, and one of eight being a federal member of parliament. The evidence is everywhere that Indigenous Australians already have a voice. Maybe we are not doing enough listening. Maybe it's the wrong voices in the wrong conversations. Whatever the answer, it's surely not yet another committee called voice. Individuals can talk directly to their local members of parliament. They can participate in and contribute to the joint and select committee processes as individuals or through organisations on matters that affect them or interest them. There's just so many ways to be heard. Some of these are replicated at a state and territory level, and there's also the Australian media when they take interest. What is most often raised about this referendum with me and the question is confusion about what Australians are being asked. And yet here we are on the countdown to the referendum on October 14. Well, the answers are simply not there. Failure to provide detail, to respect discourse, appears a deliberate design feature of this well-financed, well-resourced and well-rehearsed campaign. We don't know which recommendations contained in the extensive report by Professors Kalmer and Langton are wholly endorsed by the Prime Minister. There seems confusion in the working group itself about the detail. I've heard working group spokespersons reference the body is about negotiation, but it's actually about representation. Words do matter. I, like many of you, heard the Prime Minister tell us it's merely a modest proposal. And then a few weeks later, it was modest no more. Yet from the yes side, we are just seeing yes, you've seen the advertising. We don't know how this voice will be funded, that is still being worked out. We don't know how its members will be selected, that's still being worked out. Much of the detail we are told will come after the referendum. There is no limit to scope, so it is entirely feasible. Yes, advocates can legitimately talk about reparations, compensation and a focus on treaty and truth telling. In reflection, as a person who, in addition to my two children, took care of two wards of the state, who at their young age had already experienced devastating life experiences, I wonder how much focus is on children and the challenges they now face as adults. Of course, it won't be on them. Will they hear the voice of Benny, a child taken away in the Northern Territory by police in a way that was brutal, inhumane for any child regardless of the reason he could not stay? Will Voice step in for the family with several children who had been living on a concrete slab for two years in the heart of Alice Springs? And I can tell you when I came across those people, it was truly devastating. I don't think so. The Voice doesn't speak for them. So let's talk about accountability because that's not being talked about near enough. The issues created by the service delivery supply chain in government, in not-for-profits and in the Aboriginal community controlled sector needs a major overhaul. It's easy to talk about it like this. If a driver and the engine is not working separately and together, as they should, 
The wheels won't move as they should and won't maximise traction with the ground, where it actually matters the most. In short, it's about parliaments, public servants, policy makers, program providers and people doing better. With much of the money that comes from the Commonwealth going to the states and territories, that's where we need to focus also our accountability. We must find a way to do that to be better. Right now, I'm demanding accountability and greater transparency for the vulnerable when the Albanese government won't. We need to do more of what works and be fearless about stopping what doesn't and being courageous in sometimes giving the task to someone else. For example, Cape York residents are witnessing disturbing crime trends as Arakoon and Kawanyama have had more offences than it has residents. Cape York unemployment is double the Queensland average. Let's talk about native title and land rights and the benefits reaching rights holders now and the future flow of entitlements for future generations. Important conversations that we don't nearly hear enough of. We need to know just where the intergenerational benefits are going. In recent parliamentary sittings, my colleague Jacinta Nampajimpa Price and independent Senator Lydia Thorpe prompted by heart-wrenching, concerning stories of the impact of maladministration and potentially corruption, sought a parliamentary inquiry to hear from the people who depend on these services. What works, what doesn't? But no, said the Labor government, nah, -uh. it was no from the Greens. And it was also a no from Senator David Pocock. They did not support this important and timely inquiry. Transparency, accountability and outcomes was our goal. We got nothing. These voices are maybe too inconvenient, too loud and too uncomfortable because they are talking about issues too close to home. The Prime Minister could have legislated voice, but he didn't. When it is in the Constitution, it's permanent. Didn't we want to avoid everything being about race? I thought. Our history has taught us that. Do we really want to elevate and amplify difference? History tells us a focus on difference and the other diminishing, diminishes us all. Action, accountability, responsibility, doing more of what works and having the courage to stop doing what doesn't delivers the change. Being future focused and focus on potential possibilities and performance is the mindset that changes lives. My personal and professional experience before, tells me, before I entered Parliament tells me voice is actually the wrong path. I've worked across many industries in the resources sector, in tourism, stakeholder engagement and in communications. And I've created opportunity for well over a thousand Indigenous Australians to forge a career change with me, many of them moving from welfare to work. I have undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications in management and business, as well as professional qualifications in governance and ethics. And with that experience and learning, I have cemented my position. I've also cemented it since coming into politics 14 months ago, because I can see from the inside how and why and where we can do so much better. We must use the levers already available to us decision makers. We don't need more Canberra-based finger pointers, more reports, more advice, more talk. We need action, accountability and progress on the ground where it counts and consequences where it's not delivered. The irony is, whatever the result, this country has put us all on notice that we can and should and must do much better. The PM and his Indigenous Affairs Minister have already demonstrated one of the most concerns I hear about voice. They only hear the voices they want to hear, muscling those they don't. The more voice will not deal with practical day-to-day -day issues for the most marginalised, the most disadvantaged, or on the issues of family violence, poverty, getting children into schools. The experts in those areas will continue to do that. You know, I think just imagine what that $364 million 
and the enthusiasm of those corporates and philanthropics could have achieved if they committed to those causes rather than an unknown, risky and divisive voice. We've already been told by the voice architects, voice will be about treaty, reparations and compensation. And that's even before people are elected or appointed to it. No one can tell the voice what it can make representations on, not even the minister or the prime minister. I want to take a moment to acknowledge and celebrate the significant achievements to date because truth telling tells us it's not all bad. In my home state of South Australia, more than half of the indigenous population is in the labour force, including nearly a quarter employed as professionals or managers. Nearly 300,000 indigenous Australians in the labour force hold jobs across the spectrum of industries, tourism, government, health, construction, education, agriculture, mining, law, the list just goes on. The number of Indigenous businesses grew by 74% between 2006 and 2018. And with that, more than 22,000 jobs were created. Supply Nation registered Indigenous businesses earn more than a billion per year, with revenues growing at an enviable annual rate of 12.5%. The game changer was the Coalition's Indigenous procurement policy. 42% or 145,000 Indigenous households own a home or we are without a mortgage. But yes, we can still do better. Between 2016 and 2021, median weekly household income for Indigenous households grew by more than 18% compared with a growth of 11% for other households. But yes, again, we can do better. It is not a race of people that needs a voice. It is a group of disadvantaged people within that race of people that need a voice. They don't need this voice and they don't need it in the constitution to make the difference for them. Where issues are greater, then we must hear, engage and act more in those places. On the way here, and as you leave here, you'll see and hear a barrage of advertising. It just seems to be everywhere. It's slick, it's emotional, it's often based on celebrity endorsement, as wonderful, incredible, contributing Australians as they are, and we do love them. Think of this advertising as no different to any other. It may come with a great jingle, it may include great people who've done great things for our country. It may be everywhere but it does not mean that the product is good for you. And this offering is forever, not for this generation, but for the next and the next and the next. A deliberate design feature is we don't have detail in voice, but we can talk about what we do know. Reconciliation Australia says their work will continue regardless of the referendum result. The PM has confirmed that you are not racist, if you vote no. If you really want to walk together as equals, don't support the idea of treating people differently based on race. Don't condone overreach, but demand the same, not different. And don't agree to looking at unequal treatment in the Australian constitution forever. When you can trace your ancestry back 70,000 years ago, or you became an Australian seven years ago or seven days ago. The Australian constitution belongs to you equally and that's why we all get a vote. That's why I can't support this. I would like to have been able to vote for constitutional recognition, but for me as an Indigenous Australian, this referendum with its divisive, risky, unknown voice is the wrong proposition and so I must, on polling day, and publicly say no. Thank you. Well, many thanks to Senator Karen Little uh, for simulating and uh, well-documented speech tonight. So we come to questions and discussion. Um, uh, 
um, Naomi will be operating that two thirds of the room and I'll be over on this third of the room and um, remind everyone to keep their comments um, short and to the point. So if you just come back here, Senator. Um, tell us about how you speak to various indigenous groups. The other night on television you spoke, I think, about taking your swag, driving into parts of presumably northern South, South Australia and taking your swag, sitting down and talking to people. But when you talk to Indigenous uh, people in business, there'll be a different kind of conversation. So how do you go about your job in this area? Well, I, I'm lucky, I think, enough to have probably one of the most eclectic, eclectic and unusual um, histories of coming into Parliament. Um, I wanted to first be a stock inspector during the period of brucellosis and tuberculosis, and it's, um, it's risk to the cattle industry. So I spent my very young years chasing wild cattle around the scrub. Um, but um, my dream of that um, came to an end and I um, have done things like um, working in the human resource area for a, an energy giant, um, delivering employment outcomes for a major oil and gas project, working as a chief um, officer for human resources at Voyagers that runs Ayers Rock Resort. And in that project, we had 400, a target of delivering 400 outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a workforce of just over a thousand. Those people were expected to deliver the same service to every person that came to that resort. The, they were different in their diversity of experiences and different in their diversity of need and so we responded to that differently and individually. But there was no compromise on high expectations and there was no compromise on our willingness to support people to be successful. And I think the response for that in terms of um, our retention rate speaks for itself. Um, in the APY lands um, in far north South Australia, I also had the privilege of um, working on a project to help a family manage their own threatened species project. So um, I built a lot of additional relationships in those communities. Um, people pick up the phone. Uh, they have a conversation. They pull me up in the street. Um, um, you know, um, people in business talk to me all the time. And interestingly, um, when I watch the television and see people who are at these rallies, I ask the question of myself, who's actually not there? It's really hard to ask Indigenous people who've been successful and are working in other industries in com uh, completely independently. Doesn't change their identity, doesn't change their who they are, but they're working completely outside the government service delivery infrastructure. They're not there because they're out there working and doing their own things. But what is also very sad is when we talk about how to get change, they're not the people that are in those conversations. So I think we need to change the very basic way that we do consultation. And that's not between nine to five. That's also willing to take a swag so you can hear longer conversations. You could wait around a bit longer because in those remote areas, sometimes the tyranny of distance makes it hard to make an appointment at five o'clock. And it's easier and safer to drive in than it is, I think, to fly in, because you get so much more out of it. Thank you, so question. <coughs> Thanks, Senator. Um, a reason, albeit unconvincing, for voting yes might be that if the no case gets up, nothing will change. It'll just be more of the same. Now, you recited some figures that indicate progress is being made. But I think a lot of people voting no and perhaps voting yes take the view that um, progress is so incrementally slow in advancing um, infant mortality, education, housing, etc. What do those who support the no case offer by way of change or an improvement to the delivery of a lot of money, which isn't obviously the answer, to the Aborigine and Torres Strait Islander problem? Um, I'll answer that by saying um, the problem is actually um, exactly that, the service delivery. 
the people providing advice, people willing to have tough conversations about how the money that's already been invested has been spent. You know, I've seen examples of um, organisations given new money and they haven't even provided an annual report in years to explain what they've done with that money, who they've helped with that money. There are really basic things that we can do right now to improve those outcomes. And, you know, this proposition is for a voice. There is then a, if it's successful, um, you know, there's a whole process that sits outside of that. Nobody can tell the voice what it can do. My prediction is it will focus on voice, treaty and truth. And those people who were sitting on a concrete slab for nearly two years while still sending their kids to school um, won't be captured in a critical time frame of needing a house yesterday. And so people prepared to actually do what they need to immediately um, is really the answer to changing those lives. Because, you know, I was pretty close to that situation because I happened to stumble across it and um, it was extraordinary picking those people up one day to take them to grab something to eat. They were hungry um, and they told me that they'd been told that they couldn't get a house because they didn't have a tenancy reference. You know, how ridiculous is this? Then I get told they some of them will probably never be housed because the system doesn't allow the service providers to respond quickly to a family of four children and two adults. These were people non-gambling, non-drinking, trying desperately to keep their children safe. And they were living on a concrete slab, probably about five minutes walk from the centre of Alice Springs and they'd been there for up to two years. Service providers drove past, service providers drove in. I watched one terrific service provider who came in, picked up a quilt from a woman who is now in end stage renal failure, a young woman, um, bring the quilt back in the afternoon, back to that slab, because their job was that little bit. But imagine if people start talking about getting those people into a house quickly, those people can take control of their own lives. They don't need welfare. They don't need the hand of the government. They don't need more people to speak for them. They can speak for themselves. You give them voice. That's how you make change. Well, just before we go to this question here, just following up, the authority there in your case study you're talking about uh, in Alice Springs, is that the Northern Territory Administration? Is that the Commonwealth Administration? Well, therein lies the challenge, right? Is how you follow that money. Because once it leaves the Commonwealth and it goes to the states and territories, it is really hard to trace not just where the money goes to and how it's dispersed and who it's dispersed to and how much it's dispersed. It's also really difficult to find out um, what the return on investment is. These shouldn't be hard. They actually sit within the bureaucracy because the agreements with those service providers should ask those fundamental questions. And if they don't answer those questions to the satisfaction of outcomes, don't fund them until they do. That'll get action really quick, I think. Oh yes, I was going to ask, if the Yes campaign does succeed, what will the coalition's approach be to that? Or like from your personal view, what would your approach be to that? Well, we've been talking about regional and local voices for some time. And I talked in the speech I just gave about the importance of focusing where the attention is needed the most. So there does need to be a plan on supporting those, those places and those people that need the support the most. There's probably the biggest piece in all of this is looking internally. Looking internally about how decisions are made by parliamentarians, not just at the Commonwealth level, but at state and territory level, and looking internally how the bureaucrats deliver the intention of the funding that goes out 
to those communities. It's not about the amount of money. It's actually about how that money is utilised. I got a question earlier um, on the phone for um, uh, one of our members in Adelaide about South Australia. So what's happening at this? How do you regard what happened at the state level there since the election of the Labor government? They've got something like a voice. They've got something like a treaty. Is that right? And how do you see that? Well, um, I'll just... I'll talk about voice because um, I've been following that quite closely. So the South Australian government decided um, when it was elected to go full kilter towards a South Australian voice because it told South Australians it wanted to show us the way. It wanted to show us how it's done so there was nothing to fear, there was nothing to be concerned about. And yet now it's parked. The South Australian voice is legislated. It's not it's a bit confusing. It's kind of got a constitution, but it's actually an act. I'm not a lawyer, but I did ask for an explanation about that. It's very complicated. Um, but its voice is parked. So we've got nothing to show South Australians about it working before people cast their vote on um, this voice that's being proposed, a federal voice. So we don't know how that's going to work. We don't know how it even connects to a national voice. Um, and I think neither the state voice nor the Commonwealth voice people in the working group know that either. So we're being asked to vote in South Australia. I'm not sure on what. The uh, Hawke government set up ASIC, I think, as a voice for the Aboriginal people. It was abolished as a result of corruption and fraud by, by partisan approach. Uh, both Labor and Liberal supported the abolition of it. Had that been entrenched in the Constitution, I take it, it would have been impossible to abolish that. And I'm just wondering, uh, is that a danger then? If this, do if this doesn't work, for whatever reason, uh, that we have, and the concept, it turns out to be misconceived, there's a permanency there that uh, is not subject to uh, removal by Parliament. Well, the argument in response to that is that um, the composition and some of the functions of voice can be legislated. But the issue for me is voice is permanently, it's described in the proposition of the words in that section for the Constitution. But there's not even an explanation of what voice actually is, which is why it's completely reasonable for people to go off and call it uh, an advisory body, call it a committee, you know, talk about it having ability to negotiate rather than um, to represent. We've got uh, conversations about it having um, the ability to engage before policy is even developed, as policy is being developed, as it comes into the parliament. I've only been there 14 months and I think there's two examples of when we've had to pass legislation within 24 hours, I think. Um, so what happens when you've got something enshrined in the constitution and you're not able to accommodate representation and somebody takes exception to that? Um, it could have been legislated. Um, the Prime Minister could have even separated the two propositions. He chose not to. This is on him. He's taken this proposition to the Australian people in this way. Hi, um, I just want to go back on the problem of trying to do something to solve the intergenerational, the generational pull. There was a very good piece in the Weekend magazine in the Australian not a week or so ago. A woman who's now in Tasmania and her husband, originally I think she might have been in Armadale, but a young woman, when she was teaching, a young girl, was left at the boarding school on the holidays from Tennant Creek. And she said, her husband said, just bring her home because there was nothing for her. She brought that, they got involved in her upbringing and she successfully matured, whatever. Um, but the pull for, go, for her homeland pulled her back to Tennant Creek. And I can't remember when she had her baby there or before, but when she got back to Tennant Creek, she got absorbed into a culture of alcohol and lost her sense of purpose. 
and now her son is living with that woman and her husband in Tasmania and another boy from the same area. And this woman is trying to not to, to stop it happening again. To what extent is this gap between the homeland, the out, you know, wherever outback Aboriginal life is, and the modernisation of urban Australia, that gap, what's the difficulty of bridging it? Because this was a very sad story in one sense, or it could have been a really wonderful story if these two young men manage it. Um, one of the issues is welfare. Um, sit down money in some areas it's called. Um, you know, and having higher expectations on people um, and enabling people to deliver themselves on those high expectations with the support in sufficient measure that they need in a timely way. Um, you know, in the Northern Territory, um, we saw the removal of the cashless debit card at about the same time that we saw um, the Northern Territory government um, remove the alcohol, allow the alcohol restrictions to be removed in the Northern Territory. And the Commonwealth standing right beside them and not acting to stop them. It took them months and months and months to respond as the rate of assaults, um, the murders, the pain uh, for people living in that town just went through the roof. I remember sitting in one of those inquiries and the doctor from the Alice Springs Hospital said, there were more people that dropped off women to the hospital and emergency um, by police rather than by the ambulance. You know, um, I saw the letters from the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. They wrote to everyone to say, please do not allow this to happen. And yet people stood by and watched it. And we've now seen hundreds of millions of dollars poured into the Northern Territory to mitigate the effects of that issue. Wouldn't it have been nice to pour in that kind of money before opening those floodgates? So I think prevention, prevention, prevention is really the key. And being prepared to have some of those tough conversations with people about individual responsibility and what prevention actually means. Because um, it's simply not good enough. You know, I come from a, from a governance framework um, and the Land Council in Central Australia is not real happy with me. Um, so they're trying to tell everyone. But, um, you know, I asked them in a, in a Senate committee why they don't, with their elected representatives, require people to have police clearance checks. And they said, because the legislation doesn't require it. And I said, so you're quite happy for children to see people standing up there as elected, responsible officials, and you haven't even done the basic thing when those kids live in those communities and see the behaviour of those children. Why wouldn't an innocent child see that bad behaviour as being rewarded in a pretty cool way? It's got to be about accountability from everybody to actually say domestic and family violence is not okay. It's not for the police to tell us that. It's not for the hospital to tell us that. It's every single organisation in that service delivery supply chain that needs to tell people that. Senator, um, th there is legal opinion not only by academics, uh, well qualified, but also Queen's, King's Council like um, Stuart Wood, who say that if the yes vote succeeds, it could be challenged in the High Court because the referendum question does not specify the core function in the question of the Indigenous voice. It's misleading, it's inadequate, and people therefore are not voting for the substantive issue that the referendum question should contain? Um, 
I'm not a I'm not a lawyer, but I did hear a lot of evidence from a lot of lawyers as part of that um, consultation process. And as I said earlier, they didn't agree. There was lots of divergent views on risk. Um, but you're, you're right, there was absolute agreement. You put it in the constitution, it's the High Court that decides. And if it's ambigu if there's ambiguity, it will be the High Court that will decide um, what, what was meant, what was intended. Well, I think that's a highly, uh, a highly contentious, speculative, legal point. It comes out of a lawyer in Melbourne, I think, of all places. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think we don't know that, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen. So where do we go from here? Um, any right? I'll have to. There's a question. Whereabouts? Oh. Thank you, Senator. You started off by talking about the fact that you don't want division and definition by race, and I think you know, many well-minded Australians don't want that. I think it's on. And but many well-minded Australians think that if the no wins, Australia will be branded as a very racist country uh, and won't have supported its indigenous population. So, if no wins, what do we do to demonstrate that this country? really isn't racist and really does want equality and deals with those issues that you've so eloquently demonstrated today around service delivery being the real problem? Um, I think um, my response to questions about people is about, you know, we're, we're actually, we're all the same. We all want the same things. We want our grandchildren and our children to be healthier than we were, happier than we were, um, more prosperous than we were. Um, and these ideals um, exist in the same measure for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, I'll give you a scenario. If you are in a house and there's 15, 20 people in a house, I mean, I'll give you the example of a slab, right? On a concrete slab, there was a family who'd come to town to support a family member. I think there was about 17 of them, right? So imagine if that had a house. I was told when I tried to seek immediate emergency accommodation for them that they'd been on the <coughs> housing list for eight years, another nine years and another 12 years. These are people that would meet any measure for high risk emergency housing, which involved, I think, it's hard to count the kids, happy kids running around everywhere. It was really hard to count them. I did try a couple of times. <laughs> but, um, you know, they had children with them and they were sending those school aged children to school. I think um, when we talk about Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, we have to start from the proposition everybody has the same wishes, the same expectations, the same hope. Um, I don't think um, Australians are inherently racist, but I do think what sometimes happens is when people are surrounded, like they do with any person, with so many issues, they're homeless, they're misusing alcohol and drugs, their behaviour is affected. Um, they get angrier quicker. They get frustrated quicker. They don't want to live like that. I think people tend to uh, remove themselves from those individuals and they become further economically, socially excluded and the situation just gets worse. So we do need to make sure the experts are in the right place in the right measure. A thousand uh, sorry, not 1,000, 500, I get lost in the numbers sometimes, there's so many numbers, 500 community service workers were promised to the domestic family and violence sector by the Albanese government when they first came into government. Maybe in the last couple of weeks, but I don't think so, not one of those positions has actually been delivered. And in fact, in Alice Springs, where um, um, 
100% almost of the women that rock up at that shelter are Indigenous. They couldn't even get to the table for the money that was available post the alcohol restrictions being lifted in the Northern Territory because they weren't an Aboriginal community controlled organisation. The actual silliness that exists within our service delivery system and the decision making is quite frankly absurd. If I was rocking up there, I wouldn't care whether it was Aboriginal community controlled. I want to I care about, am I going to be treated respectfully? Is this the safest place for me to be? And am I going to get the best service delivery? But the money that they're getting, the two positions, are fixed at such a low level that what they need is clinical psychologists, people dealing with complex issues have, who have that experience, not people they can only pay at the level of a cleaner or a bus driver. It's about looking internally, not looking externally. The problem sits in the service delivery and the decisions made about that. Just a final question from someone who sent us in a note earlier from um, Central New South Wales, seeing you on television, reckons you're a pretty good performer and wonders why you went into politics. <laughs> but there are many other things you can do. <laughs> well, I actually um, came into politics quite late. Um, and I remember um, a former politician said to me, well, you don't just wake up one minute, you know, and decide you want to be a politician. And I made a very personal decision um, that I wanted to um, uh, have my children um, growing up to be adults so that I could just jump on a plane and leave them. They still whinge now, you know, <laughs> that I get on a plane and just go somewhere. Um, but it was really, that was really important to me. And I was building a future outside of politics. And I think, um, in the words of that person, a performer, I think that has given me the tools to look at an issue, critically analyse it, bring all the tools that I've learned over the years and apply it in a really respectful, evidence-based, sensible, common sense way. And I'm glad I came into politics late because I think that means I bring those tools with me and I'll continue to seek to bring to use those tools in the decisions I make and the decisions that I will make with some of my colleagues. Thanks. Thank you. Well, many thanks to uh, Senator Little for a, well, the, uh, the questioner from Central New South Wales was right for a considered, reflective, uh, informed uh, contribution tonight. Very impressive performance. We're very grateful you came and I'd just like tonight to say thank you and good luck. <laughs>